All right, guys, Jake Raby here, Flat Six Innovations, back with another RenVision technical video. Now, this is part seven of our Focus on Bore Scoring series, and in this video, we're going to bring you up to speed, 2021 speed, that is, post pandemic, believe it or not, on all the things associated with living with bore scoring. So, the meat and potatoes of this video and most of the bore scoring series was shot pre-pandemic, before we even knew what coronavirus was. But back then, we really knew what bore scoring was, and during the pandemic, we've learned a lot more about it. So the idea is to go back through, look at all of our content, update it, reshoot a little bit of segments for each one of these, and bring you guys up to speed on a focus on bore scoring for 2021. <music> Pandemic, what have we learned? Well, we've confirmed a whole lot more that we already knew, and we learned a little bit of new content just based on the way that customers were able to continue driving their cars after we learned they had bore scoring. One of the big things that we've learned about this when it comes to living with bore scoring is how long do you want to live with it? Okay? A lot of people watching this particular video are going to be sent to this video because you've sent in a submission ticket to the Flat Six Innovations Technical and Support uh, System, and I will have sent you back a canned reply because I get this question all the time with a link to this particular video and the entire series. So at the end of the day, the reason that we do that is because we see so many people that have this question, people that actually have confirmed bore scoring. It's been diagnosed, it's conclusive, you have it. So how are you going to live with it? There's two sides of that camp. The people that just want to sell the car like it is, and honestly the people who should sell the car like it is, rather than doing a cheap rebuild, putting in a used engine, doing something that is subpar, those people should sell the vehicle. I firmly believe that and always have. Then you have the camp that wants to keep the car and make it better. They love the car. Now, I used to say that my engine would cost more than your car, and that's normal. We've always seen that with Porsches since back in the air-cooled days, 912s, 356s, 914s, didn't used to be worth anything. My engine was ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 when those cars were three, five, seven, ten grand. Maybe a top-end 356 was twenty grand, but people would spend the money because they love the car. Today, it's the same way. The good news is that post-pandemic, these cars are actually worth money, and they're going up. And it's because these cars are a treasure. They're a great car to drive. They're a great car to own. They are simple, and I believe they are the last analog Porsche. They are the last version of these vehicles that I would care to own. I like the earliest 911, 996 that I can find is water-cooled. I love a 99 model, okay, just because I see so many of these cars and I love it. But certainly, a 9971 is the newest one of these cars that I would want, and I continue to cement that in my brain housing group the more that I'm exposed to later cars that are supposedly greater, but they really aren't because we get to see them from a perspective most people do not. So at the end of the day, what we've learned when it comes to living with bore scoring is much of the same thing that we've got later in this video. If you want to go ahead and address the problem with your bore scoring, we've got a great program that solves that. Of course, we reconstruct the engine. We use LN Engineering Nicosil cylinders. We're doing sumabore development. Sumabore is basically a plasma spray that makes the cylinder like a modern Porsche would be from 2022 even. 
Okay, Porsche started using this process known as Sumibor in 2000, with a 918 anyway, and they went to it later with a 9 Alpha 2 production cars, and they continue on with it. Most of the, the, the VAG vehicles, the Volkswagen Audi Group vehicles also have Sumibor. Uh, Ford Coyote engines use it, and we are the only company working with Orlikon Metco, who is a company that basically invented and developed Sumibor. Uh, we're working with Ellen Engineering and Total Seal Piston Rings along with Orlicon to develop this for air-cooled Porsches and for water-cooled Porsches. So we're not doing that for the interim, but this is something that's long-term type of development. We're talking years from now when Nicosil is basically outlawed because of the plating process that it uses being very environmentally unfriendly. We are setting ourselves up for success many, many years from now, probably a decade or so. But the point is we're still forcing on with new ways to do this and we're trying to hone the ways that we've currently got. Okay? Don't hold out for Sumobor. It's going to be a long time. It's also going to be a lot more expensive. Nicosil is proven. We've been doing Nicosil now since 1999. Every M9X engine we've ever built here at Flat 6 Innovations has used Ellen Engineering Nicosil cylinders. That includes the very first water-cooled engine to ever use them, as well as the very first air-cooled engine to use them because I built the first one. Those cylinders are still alive in my Porsche 356 that's downstairs right now. Been making 50 some odd horsepower per cylinder for 21 years at this point. So, at the end of the day, if you go through the fact that you know, you've, you've got bore scoring, let's say you're watching this video because you've got bore scoring, you're going to go through those three phases. We're going to talk about those a little bit later on here. We're going to talk about the denial, the deliberation, and the decisive moment. You're going to go through denial. Probably you're still in denial if I've sent you this link. You're going to go through deliberation. That means you're going to watch all these bore scoring videos, including this one, more than one time to see if you just want to live with this or if you want to pay the guys that are the best in the business to address this. And then you're going to go to that decisive moment. At that point, do you want to decide to sell the car like it is, decide to throw a cheap engine at it or a used engine at it? This is going to do this all over again more than likely. Or are you going to decide in, to, to do this the right way, wait in line, buy the best, and cry one time? Are you going to deliberate and do that? Are you going to decide to do that? Okay? So at the end of the day, the denial, deliberation, and decisive moment are what we want you to go through and think about. Because we want you to, if you decide to keep this car and you work with us, we want you to be a, on board 100%. We do webinars about this from customers that want to buy our engine, okay? So those are perspectives that I wanted to share with you guys before we get into this previously recorded content from 2019. Everything's been revised, everything's been updated, so I hope you guys enjoy the content on living with bore scoring. So if you're watching this, you're going to be in one of two camps. One is you hope you don't have bore scoring. You hope you never have bore scoring, and we actually are in that camp too. At the same time, maybe you're a part of a camp that has bore scoring and you're trying to live with it. It's been conclusively diagnosed that you do have this syndrome called bore scoring. So we're going to try to help both of those camps because one, obviously, if you go back to part five, we tell you all the things that you can do to hopefully prevent bore scoring. So if you're that first camp that hasn't had it yet, you don't have any of the symptoms, go watch part five of the video series, Focus on Bore Scoring, and that will be more for you. Today, my goal is to help the people that are in the second camp who have been diagnosed to help them understand what they can do to live with this. Now, I want to get this very clear to you. You're never going to reverse the problem. Once you have conclusively been diagnosed with bore scoring, it is not going to heal itself. This is not like a, a lizard that grows its tail back, okay? This is not something that regenerates. It does not get any better. When you have this problem, it is only going to get worse. And at best, you can apply some things I'm going to help you with today to hopefully keep the extensive damage or further damage from getting any worse. So the goal of this video would be to help you that have bore scoring to just keep the engine as injured as it is. 
it would be kind of akin to living with a chronic illness. So let's just assume that you're going to watch this video because you have bore scoring. There's no guessing about it. You don't think that you've got it. You have been conclusively diagnosed with visual bore scoring with a bore scope, okay? So if that's the case, you really have two choices. One, you're going to continue living with a car. You're going to drive it the way you've been driving it. You're going to continue dumping oil in it, making sure it doesn't get low on oil, taking extra oil with you everywhere you go, and dealing with smoke and dealing with all the things that you're dealing with. And if you choose to do that, that's fine. Uh, some people have better results with that than others based on how severe their case is or how extensive it is. Some people will have just one cylinder, like maybe just cylinder number six will be scored. Other people will have every cylinder on the engine scored. These two different groups of people are going to have different types of experiences when it comes to living with bore scoring. And trust me, a guy that has a scored number six can eat just as much oil and have just as many problems and hiccups as somebody with all six bores scored. Because number six, if it's scored enough, can eat just as much oil as five other cylinders that are barely scored. So if you have the scoring going on, you got to understand, of course, it's not going to get any better. Um, you know, I told somebody on the phone the other day, it's not like a lizard. It's not going to regenerate a tail. It's not going to get better. These problems are only going to get worse. Your best hope, if you're trying to live with this, is that you just limit the wear to where it is now, okay? And it never gets any worse. That's a little bit of a unicorn and rainbow syndrome because with mechanical things, it just doesn't work that way. Now, one reason for that is as you look at the cylinders in this engine, you look at the, the composition of the piston, you see that the hardest layer of wear material is found at the very surface, okay? That very, the top layer of the cylinders, of the lock of seal cylinder, is the hardest material. So as the wear progresses and as you start having scoring, all the material that is underlying below that surface is softer and more probable to wear. You're going to have the wear increase as that hardened work, work surface goes away. So as you get down to the under layers of material, the wear is going to happen quicker. And that means the consumption is going to happen more. So about the only thing you can really do at this point is to hopefully drag things out until you hopefully decide to have intervention carried out. And maybe you'll send your car to Flat 6 Innovations. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. So if you decide to keep operating the car, you need to keep a good oil in the engine, okay? Over the years, we've found some oils that get people by, okay? Valvoline actually offers an engine oil that is made for engines that consume oil. This was made specifically for Cummins diesel engines. So the composition of this particular oil is such that it doesn't really mix in the combustion chamber as bad. It doesn't really go by the rings and by the cylinders so bad. It's made for diesel engines that have a million miles on them. Now, is it the proper oil for the engine? No. Is driving an engine with an injury the proper thing to do? No. But if you choose that you want to continue operating the vehicle and operating the engine until you can get on our wait list or until you can afford to do other repairs to it or whatever, this Cummins diesel oil made by Valvoline is about the best thing we've found to help to prolong the time period that you can operate the engine. So remember, there's more to this equation than consumption. Consumption is the symptom that tells us we have a problem. Yes, the engine is consuming oil, it has a mechanical injury, it has a fault, and it's not been corrected. So the fact that you're consuming the oil is just the symptom that you're working from. A lot of times, that's the only symptom you're gonna have unless you hear the ticking so noise that sounds like a lifter or you get some misfires or whatever, but generally the engine will continue to run fine. It doesn't run poorly, it still has good power, you can even still take it to the track, but it will consume oil. That is your main symptom. So remember, it's not all about the consumption because now you may be consuming oil because it's making its way past your piston rings, going up the bore, past the piston rings, and getting in the combustion chamber where it is then being burned, therefore consumed, okay? If you have that going on, guess what? We talked about this earlier in the first couple of parts of the series where now you have combustion byproducts that are occurring in the combustion chamber going by the piston rings and by the cylinders and that is getting in your oil. 
The other nice thing about this oil is it repels a lot of these impurities and it keeps the oil from soaking up quite so much of that bad stuff. So the bad stuff that's getting soaked up as the combustion byproducts is actually carbon. So if you end up with consumption of oil going in your combustion chamber, now you end up with oil, the, the, basically the byproducts of the combustion coming by the rings, you are lacing your oil with carbon. That can run up the wear on every internally lubricated part in the engine. Now, if you still have to keep operating the engine, using something like the Valvoline oil made by Cummins will not just cut down on that consumption, but it will also help the oil to fight those combustion byproducts that is going to basically chew up the inside of the engine if you keep operating it that way. So the way I came across this oil was just being a developer. We develop things, anything from engine oils to engine combinations, whatever it is, we're always looking for the next thing that's gonna save us or help our engine be that much better. That's how we stay ahead of the other guy that's just on cruise control bolting things together. So here at Flat 6, we have an extensive backlog. One, we have it that way because we're good. I'm not saying that out of being cocky. I'm saying that because I'm confident in what we do and the fact that we've had basically a year backlog for over the last decade. Now that year backlog is from the time that we actually start a, a project with a customer till the time that the engine is completed and the car is returned. That's at least nine months and usually a year. If we get to 13 months, I cut off the schedule and won't accept any more work. That's currently where we are right now. Most of the reason why we've gotten to that point here in 2019 as of the filming of this video series is due to engines of bore scoring. That is what's driving probably 85% of our business right now is engines that have scored bores, just like what this engine has with failed pistons and bores that are being scored. So over this time, if a customer has to keep driving their car, we want to make sure that the fact they're on that wait list doesn't hamper anything. It doesn't further damage the engine. So I came up with a regimen using this Cummins diesel oil that's actually available from Valvoline to service the engine more frequently, keeping that oil purged, using this particular Valvoline Cummins oil and servicing it more frequently, obviously, helps to keep the impurities out and helps to fight consumption. So if you're one of our customers that's already on our backlog list, you're probably asking yourself, hey, you know, how, what am I gonna do for the next six or eight, nine months before you collect my car to solve this problem forever and correct the issue with your Nikki cylinders from Ellen Engineering? And I want you to understand that changing the engine oil to the Valvoline is the best thing we can do to get you through that period. So a big question I get is how long can my engine live with this problem? Well, we already realize it's chronic, it's not gonna get any better. We realize it's only gonna get worse. So what you have to go into this with is understanding that you're on borrowed time. And you need to start thinking about your options and what you wanna do. Because if you drive the engine too long and you don't service the oil like I'm talking about, or even let's say if you did something like that, and the, the dice just didn't roll the proper way for you, then you're gonna end up doing a lot more damage to all the other parts in the engine. Now, with my program, we throw away a ton of pieces, whether they're good or bad. We don't reuse things that we know have a mode of failure. We modify everything, we alter things, we use our own components, we use Ellen Engineering components that we've developed, and we throw away a lot of things that other shops would keep. One thing is we bore the original cylinders out completely and fit the block with Nikki's. Now, if you're not gonna go our way, then whoever is going to rebuild your engine, which that's a term that we hate around here because it's a real nasty word that usually just means we're gonna take it apart, put it back together with all the same problems all over again, just make it not leak, not smoke, and not make noise, okay? But if you're gonna do that, realize that you continuing to operate that engine might mean that you do more damage. So some of these people, even though we would never, never say it's a good idea, they just go in and replace one cylinder, okay? We know all the other cylinders at some point, if you don't bore them away and replace them with Nikki sleeves, then do it the proper way, we know all those cylinders are gonna go out and have the same problem the first one did, okay? I know that, that's a conclusive fact. We've seen it happen with other shops. But let's say you wanted to have something like that done and just sleeve one cylinder and make that decision. If you continue operating this engine, you can't do that because all that hydrocarbon nasty mess is gonna get in your oil. The oil then will suspend all that stuff. 
It is distributed all throughout the mechanical workings of the engine. It wipes out the oil pump, the timing chains, it wipes out all the other cylinders, it wipes out everything if you continue to operate it like that, okay? So you've got to understand, one, if you love the car, send it to flat six. That, that, that question's over with and done. Wait the required amount of time and you're finished. If you don't love the car, you gotta start thinking about selling it like it is. Hopefully you don't end up making a, a poor decision that's a, a moral decision and you dump some thick oil in it you change the oil, you send it on its way, take it to CarMax and do what we call a max attack where you just sell them the car the way that it is and the next poor soul that buys it thinking it's going to be his dream car ends up with it being his nightmare. We see that unfold all the time here at Flat 6. So hopefully you're not going to do that. But at this stage of the game, when you've got a chronic problem, you have to start thinking about the roads you can take. Are you going to take the, rump, the bumpy dirt road or are you going to take that yellow brick road? So again, how long can you get by with this? We've known some people on some forums that bragged actually about how long they were able to get by with this. And, and I made a comment that said, you know, you're doing all this damage, the guy didn't want to listen. Um, you know, he, it was one of those things where, you know, you're a fear monger, I hear that all the time. No, I'm, I'm, I tell the truth and I tell you exactly what I think that you need to hear, uh, no matter if that's what you think you need to hear or not. At the same time, this guy made it very clear that he was driving the car with an injured engine. He was consuming about a quart of oil every 300 miles, and it continued that way. About um, two years into this, all of a sudden the guy disappears, and he doesn't own the car anymore. He goes off the forum, no, there's nothing about him there anymore, and we end up with a car coming to our shop from a local person here in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta, and he had purchased the car and it came from the Midwest. And we come to figure out that this car actually came from the person that was making these forum posts. And when we disassembled this engine, having this problem, the car was actually sold at auction, the guy bought it as it was, there was nothing in the engine we could reuse. The camshaft lobes were worn out extensively, all the lifters were horrible, which we never really reuse lifters anyway here, but timing chains were destroyed, you could basically just fold them over. I mean, they were, they were horribly worn. You know, at that point in time, I told the customer, look, this engine has so much trauma that's gone on with it for so long that we're not gonna use it to build your engine. And he decided to purchase another core engine, send it in to us and have us build it. Um, the other one just got filed away into pieces and actually I have some of them here at the training facility out of that particular engine showing what not to do. So can you drive for a year or two or three like this and keep dumping oil in and live with the noises and live with the smoke and live with that thing in the back of your mind? Is this engine going to fail? Yes, you can do that, okay? But you're not doing yourself any favors and you really are creating economic stimulus for everyone that's going to touch the engine. So if you want to drive the car around for a long time, and if you want to continue operating it like that, that's a choice that you've got. Now, I would not take it to the track like that, okay? Some guys have done it. You know, I keep thinking it's just going to end up making it wear out that much faster. They go to the track and find that the engine kind of consumes the same amount of oil on the track as it did on the street. They don't care if they blow the thing up. They just keep on driving it. Hey, if that's what they want to do, fine. So people have done that. So, you know, you might decide you want to live with it. You might decide you want to go ahead and, and get started on an engine project. Whatever way you want to do it, just understand that the problem is not going to get any better without intervention. So now that we've gone over how to live with bore scoring, and really it's not going to be a good life with a car. You're going to find you don't drive it very much. You're going to find that in the back of your mind, you're always worrying about it having a catastrophic traumatic failure. And I have to tell you, that's really probably not going to happen. Um, you know, fortunately, we consider bore scoring the best failure to have because if you act on it, it has less trauma than any other failure you can have. Certainly much less than the intermediate shaft bearing failure, much less than the other 29 modes of failure that I've determined for these engines over the last 18 years at this point and adding to the list every few months it seems. So if you've got this going on, you have to wonder about what your routes are and, and all the time these days I have people saying, I'm exploring my options. Well, when that happens, I kind of smile a little bit and I start thinking that I remember a time when you didn't have any options. You either went to the factory and you bought another engine that was just like what you had that already had the same problems and it was already the exact same composition with nothing addressed internally, 
all right, you called me at Flat 6 Innovations. There was no other choice. At that point in time, we were building these engines when nobody else was. We had components out of desperation that nobody else had. At that time, Porsche wasn't selling a lot of the pieces to this engine. Um, if they were, they were in Germany. We couldn't get them here. So we had to come up with ways to make these engines our own. We changed rod bearings, crankshafts. We changed all kinds of stuff, cylinders, pistons, rings, you name it. Rob engine parts from other engines to make these things live. And even today, 18 or so years later, a lot of those engines that were living with Chevrolet rod bearings in them are still on the, ra on the track today, or on the street anyway. So back then there was no option, but back then we were almost as busy as we are today. And re people really didn't know we were doing this work. At the time, I was still really engrossed in air-cooled Porsche engines, and we still build those here today as well. But at the time, the air-cooled engine was the thing that was really bringing home the bread for us. It was, it was our thing. And these engines, of course, were failing, but many people were having a place under warranty and things like that. So when people say, hey, you know, I'm exploring my options, I start thinking about, well, you have a chance to make a bad decision. And a lot of those decisions these days are made off of price, and they're based off of how quick you want to get your car back on the road. And a lot of them today are based off the fact of what the value of the car is. So talking about that, if you're considering the value of the car and just Kelly Blue Book is the only thing that makes any difference to you, then probably waiting around for an engine like mine that's a top shelf item that has all these problems addressed, if you've got that mindset, it probably wouldn't make a lot of sense to you. Sometimes people buy the cars cheap. Sometimes they buy them cheap because they had a problem that the prior owner didn't tell anybody about. So a few weeks later, you buy the car and you realize that the cheapest Porsche you could find has turned into the most expensive that you could purchase, okay? This is a, something that happens all the time here at Flat 6. So when you're making this decision about which way to go and you're exploring your options, you have to remember that fishing lures are designed to catch fishermen and not fish. I can go outside the shop here, I can grab, look under a rock, I can get a worm and I can go catch as many fish down in the pond behind the shop as you can with a $30 lure, okay? That's just the way that it is. It doesn't look all nice on the hook, but it gets the job done. So everything that we develop here at Flat 6 is developed first and foremost with practicality and reliability and longevity in the composition. All the things we've done to make these engines live longer has actually opened the doors to make the engines bigger without any negatives. So this engine here is the M9603. This came out of a 2002 up to a 2004 996, 3.6 liter. I can take this engine with scored bores and a factory 96 millimeter piston and I can build this into a 4 liter engine. I can do that based on the over a decade of development with that particular combination and know it's not going to have bore scoring again, know that it's not going to have all the problems the factory engine had, knowing it's going to have my IMS solution fitted to it, and knowing that when somebody spends the money that's required on this car, that it will become something that not everybody has. So we will never even build probably one half of 1% of the M96 and 97 engines that were built. We just physically can't do it and we're smart enough not to drive. So we end up trying to do the best quality, not the most quantity. That's why we always employ overkill engineering here at Flat 6 Innovations. So if you decide you really love the car, and I, that four letter word L-O-V-E, love the car, if that's in your vocabulary and defines this vehicle, then I'm the guy you need to talk to because I'm the guy that's gonna be able to perform and give you the longest amount of return on investment for the engine, period. It will cost more. Sometimes it's gonna cost double, but you learn that just like the Porsche, a lot of times the, the most expensive Porsche engine you can buy is the cheapest one that you find. Now, unfortunately, you end up having to experience that and be like some of the people in the testimonials on our website who did go that way and lost fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 sometimes, at least six or $8,000, and ended up with a core engine we couldn't even reconstruct anymore because it was so hodgepodge together. You have to have had that kind of experience to really appreciate it. So the smart guys aren't going to want to go that route, obviously. So it takes somebody that really wants it, that loves the car. 
So if you do love the car, you have to ask your question, what do these guys do that's so much different than everybody else? Why is the engine so much more money? The main reason is that here we have one builder assigned to every build. So you end up in a scenario where you don't have a mass production team. You don't have an assembly line. One person's hands and mind is going to put that engine together. Once I assign the builder to that job, he will stay with that job from the time the car comes in until the time the car leaves. He will be the person that does everything with that engine, including the first time that it starts up. That engine will basically assume his identity, just like it assumes my identity as the founder of the company. And it, these engines are always mine, and they're always that builder's. That's just what we put into what we do. At the time of this video being shot, my newest employee that is building these engines has been here for 13 years. So you're getting somebody who's a seasoned veteran that's been around since the early days of this program, and they learned along with me what it takes to make these engines work, okay? So these are big things. Now, if you start getting into the physical details or the differences from one engine to another, all the other guys are shooting for what we do. They want to make their engine look like ours because we are the top of the food chain. When you're at the top of the food chain, you always have a target on your back, okay? I've had a target on my back my entire life in the Porsche industry because I've always strived to be the best and I'm always at the top with everything that I do. So when we came up with the practices with LN Engineering to fix these cylinders, a lot of these other companies ended up being partners, or not really partners, we'll say, but customers of LN in their early days. When those shops were learning about how to put these engines together, some of which were only three or four years ago at the time of this video, they would use the LN cylinders and they would you know, basically let LN do some of their homework for them, but then they started figuring out ways they could try to cheap out on it and make the engine cheaper. So they started putting in other cylinders, things that didn't take quite so much time, things that weren't quite so developed, things that had weird metallurgy that was cheaper to do, like putting an iron cylinder inside of an aluminum crankcase. Things like that do not promote the right expansion rates and things like of this nature, so it makes the engines have negatives, okay? Now, with the Ellen Engineering Nikki cylinders that we use, and we've used in every engine we've built, in the M96 and M97 since the beginning of the program. And you have to think back, we developed these cylinders with LN starting back in 1999. The very first set of cylinders that they ever built are still in service on my Porsche 356 engine that's been making 220 horsepower for the last 20 years out of a little four-cylinder air-cooled engine. Okay, so we go back to the beginning with LN. Now, my affiliation with LN basically goes back to Charles Navarro and his, par his business partner at the time, they were just partners on a school project. They came to me and said, what do you think about doing this? Nobody wants to listen to us about it. Do you think it'll work? I said, not only do I believe it will work, I think once we prove that it works, I want to be your first customer. And I was. And that's what started our alliance. Now, we're not vested in each other's companies, but we do rely on each other for development and for manufacturing. So it works very well. So the difference between Nikki's cylinders from Ellen Engineering and others is basically the nickel process is a nickel silicon carbide process. Now you can go all the way back to the very first video in our series, Focus on Bore Scoring, to understand about that particular process. Now I'm going to grab something here, which is actually a 996 turbo cylinder, and this is nickel. Okay, this is factory nickel. So all the Metzger engines up through the GT3. Uh, the, the, the generation of the Metzger engine in the GT3, that is, have Nikasil cylinders. All the 996, 997 turbos that are up to the end of the Metzger series have Nikasil cylinders. With the engines here at Flat 6 Innovations, we use this same technology that was never abandoned by Porsche for those GT and turbo cars, and we apply it to the M96 engine. Now, to be able to do that, you first must machine away the original cylinders in their entirety. Only the very bottommost portion of these cylinders are kept, and that's just for alignment purposes. So the way that we make sure we don't have this problem again is we remove the problematic cylinder from the equation, okay? So some of these other people that are going out there and they're putting a sleeve in the original cylinder, even if it's a steel sleeve or some other kind of aluminum sleeve, they're not really getting any more strength or not really solving any more problems because the parent material that is known to crack and have problems is still there. So removing that all the way down to the bottom of the water jacket is the key 
to get better thermal conductivity, reduce friction, and therefore take away all the problems these Locasil cylinders have. So what we do here at Flat 6 Innovations that makes the Flat 6 difference doesn't stop with the cylinders. So anything that we've learned as researchers and developers with these engines has been done with the sole reason to help the car owners understand their car and so we can provide a better, more adaptable type of engine for the application. Somebody that wants to go to the track, we're going to build their engine different than somebody who's going to drive the car on the street and vice versa. People that want to do certain types of competition, people that want to do certain kinds of uh, you know, autocross or, or whatever the case may be, we have ways we can change the engine internally to benefit those particular applications. So we're not just stopping with cylinders, but the cylinders are the biggest part of what we go into one of these Flat 6 Innovations engines. Now I want you to understand that since we developed this alongside LN Engineering and we're their very first customer, I know more about how to use these particular cylinders and pistons with a Nicosil plating than anybody you're going to run into because my development is what led to all the changes at LN Engineering to make the product better. At the same time, a lot of tricks I've kept to myself. So we learn different ring gaps, different roughness averages, different things we can do that help make our engine different. Now you may be told by somebody, they're going to say, well, you know, I can buy all the same pieces that that, that guy Raby does at Flat 6 Innovations to build my engine. Well, no, you can't. And the reason for that is because we have to purchase all of our components up front. We do special runs a lot of times with LN or other companies or things we build ourselves. So no, you can't purchase a lot of the same things that we do. We also apply performance coatings and we do things to cylinder heads with these engines that nobody else can, can do. So the engine that we are able to produce for you is something that's a lot more advanced. It has an LN cylinders, it has the, the forged pistons, it has the total seal rings, it has a lot of these other things in its composition every time. And we also don't build something that's sold to you as a stripped down model. You know, when you call and get a price for us, that is what that engine is going to cost. It's a big number and it's going to cost that amount of money. We don't sell you something that's stripped down and add on a bunch of little stuff that you really have to have to make the engine more expensive. With us, anything that you end up purchasing as an option is truly an option that is consumer wanted. It's something that you want, be it an exhaust or an intake or whatever the case may be. If it's something we are offering as an option, it's something we've proven and it's something that you want, okay? So now if, you've, if you're wondering about what to do with your engine, if you don't want to have the same problems all over again, if you don't want to go to a copycat that's trying to ride on our coattails, if you want to come to the people that developed this here in North America, come to Flat 6 Innovations. We'll provide something for you that's hand-built and will solve your problems.